Okay, so that's how Unit 2 fits into context in this introductory physics course. Now let's look at the uh, particular topics that occur in Unit 2. And I'll give you a few brief tips along the way. So here I've broken it up into uh, five major topics. Uh, constant acceleration in one dimension. Forces and force balance in two dimensions. Projectile problems. Circular motion. And orbital motion. Now here's how these all fit together. We basically begin our study of kinematics with this uh, topic of constant acceleration in one dimension. We're going to then build on that to address all these other types of motion. And in learning that material, what I'm going to suggest to you is that there are these three basic formulas that get used over and over again. I've only written one of them here. I'm going to uh, lay out all three of them when I do specific examples and go into these um, topics in more depth. But there's three of these equations. For instance, things like the final velocity is the initial velocity plus the acceleration times the time. And the basic approach to any problem, basically, then, is to first translate into mathematics and algebraic statements all of the information that they give you in the problem, combine that, then, with these three basic formulas to derive a set of equations which then you should go ahead and solve. I recommend this procedure because I've noticed that students in this course are very good with their algebra. And once you've translated all the physics into mathematics, that's kind of the tricky and unfamiliar part. But once you've managed to do that, then usually you know what to do to solve the equations. You have to substitute in one thing for another or, or something along those lines, something that you're very familiar with and very, very good at already. And so it's just a matter of uh, learning how to do this translation stage first. Doing it this way, turning it into an algebra problem, I find, helps keep your thinking organized because of your previous training in algebra. If you try thinking about the uh, physics and trying to figure out how I should answer all these questions uh, without looking at the algebraic framework, sometimes you can uh, get yourselves lost or end up uh, chasing your tail going in circles. So that's a, a constant theme throughout this course of translating things into math and algebra and then solving them. That we'll see as we, uh, as we develop the course further later on. Okay, the next major topic are forces in multiple dimensions. And this all really builds on material I've, I've described in some depth before in that uh, podcast that I have on free body diagrams and how to draw them. Those are on that uh, blog, and there are links to this on the Blackboard site. So I highly recommend, for reasons of time in today's podcast, that for that discussion on forces in two, in two dimensions, you refer to my podcast on free body diagrams. It does involve a lot of, uh, or a fair amount, I should say, of trigonometry. So now is a good time to review your uh, basic trigonometry. They end up being just two basic formulas that are used over and over again uh, from, from trigonometry. And one of these is that, for instance, the uh, force and the, the x component of the force is generally the force times the uh, cosine of the angle and that the uh, y component of something is generally the magnitude times the sine of the angle. Or if you want to think of this sort of more generically, the basic trig formula here is that the adjacent side is equal to the hypotenuse times cosine, and the opposite side is the hypotenuse times the sine. And I would say that memorizing the trig formulas in this form, rather than saying cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse or sine is opposite over hypotenuse, if you memorize them in this order, that's really good because this is the order that you usually end up applying them in. You're usually looking for components of your forces, and so knowing immediately how to calculate adjacent and opposite sides is going to save you a lot of time. So that's my basic uh, two cents on the uh, forces in two dimension. The other last bit, which I think actually is mentioned in that podcast, is you have a choice of uh, how to align your x and y axes. And the main trick, the art there, uh, is always just to make sure to choose your axis pointing so that either the x or the y, one of them, is pointing along the direction of the acceleration. If you do that and stay organized, write down your algebra, and then solve, things are going to go pretty well for you. Okay. The next uh, major topic area is projectile problems. 
And the key trick to projectile problems is to realize that these are also constant acceleration problems, but now the motion is occurring in two dimensions instead of one dimension. But the really uh, surprising thing, and it took people quite a while to figure this out, the surprising thing is that the x and y motions are really independent of one another and can be analyzed independently. So we follow the same organizational pattern where then we have a series of algebraic statements or clues that are given in the word problem that tell us something about the velocities or the accelerations in the x and or the y direction. We write down all of those equations, translate all that physics into more algebra, and then we solve. And again, I'll run some examples of this so you can see how that idea plays out in projectile problems. Circular motion is another uh, special case of motion in two dimensions. Here, the basic idea is that um, as you move around in a circle, there's a certain a centripetal acceleration. And you just have to apply Newton's laws carefully, taking this acceleration into account. Now, this... Uh, topic really is uh, in some ways can be looked at as just another application of the free body diagrams and uh, applying Newton's laws but sometimes it's a little bit counterintuitive and uh, it's worth then having a, su a sub it, it turned into a subject of its own because many things actually do move in circles and one specific example of circular motion is orbital motion and really, this is just a special case of circular motion. I've included it as a separate topic, even though it is just a special case, because sometimes the idea of orbits are a little bit uh, less intuitive than just plain old circular motion. So what I'm going to do to review these is, when I do my circular motion problems, the particular example I'll do with you is one that actually involves orbital motion. So that way, I'll be able to cover these two topics with one uh, nice long example. Okay, so now we're going to go on to the examples.